Welcome back to another episode of Mission in 5, the podcast, where we ask five simple questions to everyday ministry practitioners to learn more about who they are as people and where they see God moving in their local communities. I'm your host, Greg Mamula. Well, welcome back to Season 2 of Mission in 5, the podcast. Last time we spoke with Pastor Aaron Sprock of First Baptist Church in Shadron, Nebraska. He shared about his life and ministry in Wyoming and western Nebraska. He also shared about his congregation's recent mission trip to Puerto Rico to participate in the rebuilding, renewing, and restoring mission project there. So be sure to go back and listen to that great interview. Well, my guest today is Brian Kaler. He is the editor and director of Word and Way magazine, host of the podcast Baptist Without an Adjective, and a co-director of ChurchNet. Word and Way began as a weekly Missouri Baptist newspaper in 1896, and for many years, its primary focus was on the life and the work of Missouri Baptists. Over the past several decades, as Baptists continue to wrestle with our identity by creating new associational partnerships and organizations, Word and Way has grown by expanding its scope and journalistic reporting beyond Missouri Baptists alone. In 2001, Word and Way became a self-governing newspaper independent of the M- Missouri Baptist Convention. Today, Word and Way has an active website that is updated regularly, has an e-newsletter called Between the Lines, and continues to produce a monthly printed magazine distributed across many states in the Midwest. Word and Way was um, Word and Way has contributing authors from many forms of Baptist life, including Missouri Baptists, Southern Baptist, ChurchNet, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, Baptist World Alliance, and American Baptist Churches USA. As a nonprofit, free press newspaper, Word and Way is supported through organizations, institutions, churches, and individual uh, donations. Word and Way's current editor and my guest is Brian Kaler. Brian took on the role and editor of President of Word and Way in November 2016. After serving as a longtime staffer with ChurchNet and Ethics Daily and as a freelance writer for Word and Way, Brian is leading Word and Way to be a unifying force in Baptist life as its journalistic scope grows to include American Baptist news and churches in Kansas, Nebraska, and beyond. One of the ways that Brian is unifying Baptists is through his podcast called Baptist Without an Adjective, where he interviews Baptist leaders and missionaries from around the world to share what Baptists are doing in various ministry contexts. His interviews have included Baptist World Alliance leaders, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship leaders, missionaries, and our own American Baptist Churches USA's leaders and missionaries. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk with us a little bit today, Brian. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, our format is easy enough. We ask uh, ministry practitioners like yourself five simple questions to learn more about who you are and where you see God moving in your community. So um, let's just jump right in. A lot of people in Nebraska may not know who you are. So who is Brian Kaler? Yeah. Well, so I am a native Missourian, although I also spent several years out in Virginia before returning okay. back here. And I am the editor and president of Warden Way. And we can talk a little bit about the ministries a little bit later. I also serve as associate director of ChurchNet. Okay. I've been a long time contributing editor at Ethics Daily, though I joke that I am a not very often contributing, contributing editor now, uh, since I took the word away job. Okay. Uh, but still, still excited to be associated with them and, and support that, that ministry. I live in Jefferson City, Missouri, which is where I grew up, uh, and uh, I'm married, and we have a six-and-a-half-year-old son. And so that's a, kind of a, a rough outline of who I am. Yeah, very good. So you're a, you're a writer. You basically write for a living. You're an editor. Um how did you come to be at Word and Way and 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 ChurchNet and, and the various other things, uh, Ethics Daily? I mean, there's a lot of writing and journalism and, and those sort of things going on. So, uh, tell us a little bit about how you became an editor. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily. I don't know. It, sometimes I, I think I kind of backed into it, and on the other hand, you know, looking backwards at the path, it seems perhaps a little bit more deliberate than it than it felt. Okay. Uh, but I felt early uh, well, growing up, I felt a, a call to to ministry but wasn't exactly sure what type of ministry. Mm-hmm. You know, they had the kind of the traditional boxes. It was like, well, are you going to be a pastor or a music leader or a missionary? And I didn't right. really feel like any of the boxes actually really fit. But at the same time, I felt very strong a, a call to ministry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I did some started doing some preaching late in high school. I went to college at Southwest Baptist University okay. in Bolivar, Missouri. Right. 
And there, in high school, I had joined the speech and debate team and enjoyed that, and so I was doing that at SBU as well. And so I, I signed up for a, a double major to get communication in addition to pastoral ministry uh, because I thought, well, I'm going to be over there all the time anyway, so I might as well get, get some credit for it. Right, yeah, and that's helpful. Really, yeah, and that's where I, I, it, that really started to resonate with me, those, those classes and studies and uh, by the time I, I graduated, I, I really wrote myself down the other direction, that I was a communication major with a double major in pastoral ministry. Okay. And so then from there, well, I should I should say, I also, my last year of, of SBU, I did do one year of study uh, at Midwestern uh, Abbott Theological Seminary in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. And I was doing that, I was a part-time student at SBU because I had finished my hours, but I had stayed away sit around to do my senior year on the speech and debate team. Okay. Uh, and so I was taking some credits, not, they would let me take some hours, even though I hadn't graduated, so I would commute a couple days a week. Uh, and at the time, I was still kind of kind of thinking about a more traditional ministry route. I uh, was actually looking, and I know you probably appreciate this because uh, you've studied there, I was actually looking at, at maybe Northern Seminary All right, yeah. Uh, when, I, when I graduated from SBU. Uh, but it, a lot of things happened that year, including I got kicked out of Midwestern. Uh, and so, <laughs> there's a story there, I'm sure. There, well, yeah, I wrote a paper. You know, so this writing, 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 get you in trouble, right? Uh, especially yeah, absolutely. Opinionated. So I wrote a paper, uh, really just to get a rise out of people, and it was a lot more successful than I had anticipated. Okay. And so I wrote a paper about why women should be allowed to be pastors. Yeah. At Midwestern, the Southern Baptist School, that's not necessarily the, the line. They're not they, known they for this. There. And so I was placed on academic probation. Uh, I was declared uh, not proficient in English, uh, put on <laughs> academic probation. And Communications major. So I took a remedial English course. Okay. So anyways, I instead, uh, between that and some, some research that I was doing, both in the religion department and communication department, really got excited about academic research and intense research and writing. And so when I graduated at SBU, I actually went to University of Missouri. Okay. And I did my master's and then stayed for my PhD in political communication there at MU. And most of my work was looking at the intersection of religion and politics. And it was while I was there that I also started doing some part-time communication work for this new Baptist convention now known as ChurchNet, the okay. Baptist General Convention of Missouri. Uh, mostly at the time, at the time it was all uh, churches that were formerly Southern Baptist, uh, but because of some of the divides that were happening in Southern Baptist life, and particularly in the Missouri Baptist Convention life with uh, litigation that was erupting and, and right. some, of the, some of that conflict, uh, as, a, as a way of kind of moving away from the conflict, moving away from the lawsuits, and trying to find a healthy way of doing ministry. And so I uh, was there at Columbia uh, for those five years with those two degrees. And then I actually went to James Madison University uh, Public School in Virginia and taught for six years uh, in the communication department, primarily doing classes on political communication, media politics, uh, research methods, introduction of public speaking, everyone's favorite gen ed. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I did that for six <laughs> years, continued to do some work for ChurchNet remotely, was doing quite a bit of writing for Ethics Daily and some other uh, freelance writing. Sure. Wrote a couple of books. But wow. ultimately, we, we kind of felt the move to come back to Missouri, and so I continued to do some freelance writing, and then uh, the job opened up here at, at Word and & Way. And wow, that's quite the so, journey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move into a little bit of your personal life then. Um, do you have any hobbies, passions, interests? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I've always enjoyed, enjoyed reading and writing, and so, I mean, which has moved from being just a hobby and a passion to so obviously employment as well, which mm-hmm. is nice yeah. uh, when that happens. And, and so, and I think that that's pretty natural to the reading, particularly when I, when I read something that's really cool and I have that feeling of, boy, I wish I would have written this. Right. That kind of inspires, yeah. you know, I think uh, the, the writing uh, as well. I've, been, I've enjoyed opportunities the last several years, particularly to, to do some, some travel internationally, to meet with Baptists, in various contexts, particularly uh, through work with the Baptist World Alliance, and I serve on a couple of, of committees and commissions, and uh, just, and, I, and again, I know I keep kind of mixing, but, you know, I just enjoy going there sure. and, and hearing their stories and helping tell their stories, uh, and so it does become a little bit of occupation as well, but it doesn't really feel like I'm working 
right. when I'm when, I, when I'm telling those kind of stories and taking some photos and doing and, and seeing new places and trying new foods. Uh, and so those those are some of the some of the things that I particularly enjoy. And then of course I, ha- I have a, a six and a half year old son, and you know we're always playing and, and wrestling. And, yeah, and so that takes a lot of my time as well. All right. Well, so I, uh, I should probably yeah yeah one of the things that I I would add on that you know is in that in that time period where I was doing a lot of freelance writing, um, we, we we had our son when we were when I was still in Virginia for a couple of years before we moved back. Okay. Uh, and part of that was to move back to be closer to family and, mm-hmm. and kind of prioritizing uh, that, which which is something I think that we've lost a lot in our society yeah. uh, as we move around a lot more. Uh, and, and also, it was just it's been kind of interesting to be at, at times the kind of stay at home dad and seeing and do you know doing freelance writing can mostly work out of my office at home, mm-hmm. you know, particularly while he was napping when he was younger. That was always nice, uh, and kind of seeing how that impacts our. Uh, our understanding of gender roles and families, mm. and so that's been that was also very eye opening and interesting to kind of to see that, uh, and you know to I think that there's a lot more of that happening in our society today, and we haven't always caught up with uh, how how families are operating in 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 unique and different ways. Yeah, my uh, my wife and I made a decision. We have two kids, ten and seven. And, um, you know, she, she was home for, for the first few years before the kids went to school full time. And uh, I never had that opportunity because I was always in ministry and, and working in churches and uh, the region here. Um, but then this summer I had a sabbatical and um, I was home with them for, for two and a half months during their summer break. And it was a uh, it was a really good experience, a really good time to, to really connect with them. And I made a lot of dinners. And, you know, yeah. all those things that you do. And it, it, yeah, it was it, a really it, cool experience for me. Yeah, it's great. At different phases in our, in our marriage, one of us has cooked more than the other. Right. Kind of, it kind of changes, to, you know, based on schedules and so forth. Uh, and I used to always joke that I was going around hanging out with all the, uh, uh, the stay-at-home moms because, you know, my son and I would go to these events and it would yeah. be, you know, a bunch of kids. And, and, and But, you know, it would also, I think, is something that, I'd like to see at our churches kind of a more uh, of a awareness uh, of this because, you know, we, we, we would go somewhere and my wife would always get the question of, you know, well, do you work outside the home? Mm-hmm. She's a computer software uh, programmer, software engineer. Uh, and so, you know, she would ask, you know, she'd answer the question and then they would ask me, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And I would joke about that when I was at the time, I literally, my office was in, office was in the home. Right. So, I mean, yes, I was working, but I wasn't working outside the home. Right. And I just thought that was interesting. She would get the question, do you work outside the home? And I get the question, what do you do? What do you do? The assumption that I, I clearly go to an office uh, somewhere. And even sure. now, though, we have an office at Word and Way that's in a, a church, uh, which, is, you know, we get free grants, so that's nice. Yeah. Uh, I, I also often work still at home based on school schedules and so forth. Uh, uh, out of there, so I, I just think that's something that we, we in our in our in our congregations could pay a little bit more attention to uh, today, because I think we're seeing family life and in a lot of healthy ways of parents engaging and not just kind of separating out the roles in mm-hmm. one way or another. I, I think it's it's good for families. It's good for kids. Yeah, yeah, it's good for for everybody. I think when. You, you have that flexibility to, to be home more. Um, some jobs maybe don't lend themselves to that. There, there are times, though, like even with what I do, I, I tend to travel. And so I'll take my, my kids with me when we go visit churches um, and, and go to different events around the region or the area. And so they get exposed to lots of different type of church contexts and uh, worship styles and, and those sort of things. And I, I, th- I think that's part of it, too, is, is that they get to experience things differently than if you just went to the same place every day uh, all the time. Um, well, you, let's move into number four then. You know, what, 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 you're doing a lot of different ministries. You're, you're connected to a lot of different things. Um, ChurchNet, uh, you're connected with Word and Way, obviously. Um, you are connected with uh, Ethics Daily. You have a podcast called Baptist Without an Adjective. 
um, amongst many other things, you have your own website and blog, and so you're constantly writing. But um, if you just kind of walk us through some of that, and for for many of our Nebraska listeners, they may not be aware of exactly what is ChurchNet or um, what is you know. I mean, a lot of them know about Word and Way, the magazine, um, but maybe just remind them of uh, the many different things that you're doing and, and how they're connected. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I do wear a lot of hats. And sometimes I'm working with the same people in different organization contexts. We kind of have to start our conversations with, okay, I'm, I'm wearing my Word and Way hat right now. Yeah. So that we kind of keep, keep straight what's going on. So mm-hmm. Word and Way is the, my, my primary hat. Okay. It takes up most of my time as, as editor, do quite a bit of writing in the magazine, as well as the editing and, and planning out what's going to happen with that. And so we are a, we're an interesting publication. We're unique in Baptist life in that we are, I think, the only local, regional, like, kind of pan-Baptist publication. Yeah, they're the only one we, I can think of. Yeah, that we're not connected to a specific uh, Baptist convention, mm-hmm. which is a little bit, in many ways, we've kind of gone back to our our, our founding. Mm, yes. So actually, for the first 50 years, Word and Way was an independent publication, Okay, uh, primarily based in Kansas City, Missouri. While Missouri Heavy was a little bit, kind of regional focused there being in Kansas City they would look across the border as well sure. and kind of cover Baptist life uh, and then it went through a period of a little bit more than 50 years where it was tied to the Missouri Baptist Convention mm-hmm. uh, and which then just about, to clarify the Missouri Baptist Convention is is separate from the Southern Baptist Convention or right, it's, it's, it's the state it's a yeah, region it's of state, the SBC yeah of of right uh, okay. of Southern Baptist um and has been for, for quite a while, although there was, and this is something that I, I write about in Word and Way, and it's one of, I think, something that kind of is my vision for Word and Way, is there was a brief period in Missouri Baptist life where Missouri Baptists were essentially neither northern nor southern, mm-hmm. uh, to use the language back when American Baptists were northern Baptists. Right. And so after the Civil War, the Civil War of Missouri was a border state. Right. Uh, it was split. We actually had two governors. Uh, one was aligned with the North and one aligned uh, with the South. Uh, the state never actually left the Union, but there was a big movement among some to try to pull it into the Confederacy. Okay. And so we saw that in Baptist life as well. And so there were actually uh, two Baptist conventions, one aligned with the North, one aligned with the South. After I didn't the know Civil that. War, they came, yeah, it was a very brief period. But after, so after, the, after the Civil War, the two conventions actually came back together. And then a little bit later after that came up with what they called the Missouri Plan. Mm-hmm. And it was this attempt to bring national reconciliation. They really saw it as a model for Baptists across the country. That part never happened. But it, it, essentially it was the, we are going to be both northern and southern, okay. uh, supporting ministries in both of the conventions. And I, I think a lot of it was based on this idea of, hey, we split as Baptists nationally in 1845 over the issue of slavery. Mm-hmm. And that has now been politically, militarily solved. And so there's, there's really not a reason to be separate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they, they launched this Missouri plan, uh, and it, it's a period that lasts about 30 years uh, as a plan before it ultimately kind of fizzled out. There are still some churches in Missouri that, from that time period, are still duly aligned today. Okay. Although I think all of them are in, are duly aligned today with American Baptist and Cooperative Baptist. Okay. Or historically with American Baptist and Southern Baptist, but I think they have all switched to Cooperative Baptist on that dual alignment. So uh, so, so one that I know that about historic. off the top of my head might be University Baptist in Springfield. Are there others? Yes, University of Baptist Church in Springfield, which I should mention, I, I kind of skipped over this, so when I was at SBU, that's where I did my pastoral internship. Oh, okay. One of the two, one of the two churches that I have been on staff was staff at was at University Heights, and that's when I okay. kind of began to learn about this this history of dual alignment there. Okay, very cool. Yeah, there's a uh, there's First Baptist in Columbia. Uh, there's uh, a couple in St. Louis. There's, there's yeah, not as many as there used to be. There's a yes. third Baptist in St. Louis that we did yes, some ministry partnership with one time as a mission trip as a youth group when I was on staff in North Platte, and I think they're ABC as well. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and so that that vision, uh, I've written about this some in one way, and that, that's kind of in some ways the vision that we see today as trying to be a force for bringing Baptists together across these uh, these lines. In, in the podcast, and we'll talk about that in a moment, we, we'll talk about the, 
the denominational, ethnic, national, and ideological lines that too often divide us. Mm-hmm. And so having these conversations. And so in each issue of Word and Way magazine, uh, we try to make sure that we are covering all the different varieties of Baptist here in the Midwest region, uh, be that American Baptist and Cooperative Baptist and Southern Baptist and National Baptist. Uh, and, and so that I think it's important that we learn about other types of Baptists here in our area, that we learn from each other, we learn about each other, that we have conversations with each other. And so we're trying to be a place where that happens. And there's not very many of those spaces in Baptist life today yeah, where, th- where people cross those lines. Yeah, I think that's a really important um, thing to think about, especially he- here in the Midwest. I mean, there's not a lot of American Baptists um, to begin with. You know, they're they're kind of a, a, a smaller body. Um, and, and just having other people to work with ecumenically and to people they can identify with as Baptists, I think, is a, is, is a noble cause, to be sure. Yeah, I think so. And, that, and that's, so that's part of the name of our, our podcast that we launched in March, Baptist Without an Adjective. And it is this idea that we're trying to learn what does it mean to be a Baptist, uh, not, not a, a Southern Baptist or an American Baptist or a cooperative Baptist, but that Baptist without that adjective. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we feature different interviews with people from various different Baptist bodies. Uh, we've had uh, Lee Spitzer mm-hmm. uh, on before, we just had uh, Sharon Coe, the right. National Ministries. Uh, Molly Marshall, and then we've had the uh, cooperative Baptist leaders, and uh, and then we've had a number of international leaders. I think I think we've had about ten different countries that yeah. have had a Baptist leader uh, involved in uh, as well. And so, just a way again of, of of hearing from each other and hearing these voices that we may not necessarily hear within our own denominational tribe. And I think that's important, and that's one of the things that we're trying to create a space for. So, are you creating space not just for? Um, denominational differences, because cause there is a little bit, you know, in the way that we're structured, that American Baptists are different from cooperative Baptists that are different from Southern Baptists just structurally. Um, but there also seems to be some, I don't know, call it theological, call it spectrum type language people use for conservative, moderate, progressive Baptists. Um, do you feel like that's part of it as well? I do, I do. I do feel like that we have a variety of voices we've had. Uh, you know, sometimes the, the, the voice on one of the two extremes, if we print it in the magazine, that's the, that's the one I'll get a phone call about or a letter to the editor. And, and it's often nice to be able to then mention, well, did you see so-and-so's piece in that exact same issue? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so we do try to have, you know, a wide, pers- a wide variety of, of voices and perspectives that would go from left to right and places in the middle. I do think that that's important that we're, you know, as I mentioned, my, my PhD is in political communication. And, and one of the things that I find particularly concerning is that uh, in many ways, I'm afraid that party ID is the new religion mm. in our society. That that's where we get our identity first. That's, that's who's shaping our worldview. And, and this has actually been, been borne out in some research, uh, Robert Putnam at Harvard and David Campbell at Notre Dame, uh, they had a book a few years ago called American Grace. Mm-hmm. And one yep. of the things they found in their multi-year research of talking to Americans across the country over several, over, over many years, is one of the things they found is that 40 years ago, if your pastor said something that did not align with your chosen political party, mm-hmm. that conflicted in some way, that you were more likely to change your party or at least your politics. Okay. And today it's the opposite. Right, you change your pastor. That if your pastor says something that's in conflict with your chosen political party, you're more likely just to change your church. Wow. In many ways we are becoming red churches and blue churches. Mm-hmm. And, and that's actually, and then when I, when I tell this to pastors, I, I always have to note, that's actually even worse than it sounds. Right. It's not that churches are now the second, you know, we've moved from being the main influencer of worldview to being second. That's, that's, not, that's giving, giving us too much credit. Right, you're you're not second. You're only being tolerated as long as you go along with the chief worldview uh, yeah. uh, influencer, and that is our chosen political parties. And so that's that's a space that I think is now it's a space that's really really dangerous to get into. And I lose subscribers if you know when when we bring in these voices that they don't like. But I think it is important that we have a space where we can hear from a, a liberal, a democratic. Baptist voice, and then also hear from a conservative or Republican 
Baptist voice and, and have these uh, conversations. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's difficult to have those, but we, we desperately need those. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that, that if any body, you know, and by, by body I mean a body of, of, of Christians, um, could make this adjustment, it would be Baptists, because it, it's so built into our DNA to talk about uh, autonomy and the priesthood of the believer, and, and, and to tie into kind of this idea of politics being uh, a driving force of, of how faith works in, in our culture these days is, 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 I think, one of the reasons that, that we're so intolerant um, of one another theologically as Baptists is because maybe we just don't really believe in the priesthood of the believer, um, despite everything we say about it, because if we really believed in that, we would give that person space to think through their faith and exercise it, um, because that's a Baptist principle, you know, is to give yeah. everybody that space. And now we're saying, no, you don't have that space because if you're not with me, you're against me so often. Yeah, and it's difficult to live in those those areas of of, of disagreement, and yet that's what, you know, Christ's kingdom, the Christ table is all about. Right. Uh, you know, even in his own disciples, you know, we have a wide variety uh, from the zealots to the tax collectors, <laughs> all in fellowship together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very good. Well, you, uh, you, you have this huge heart for Baptists, and, and you have had opportunity to, to read um, from many different Baptist voice. Um, you've also interviewed several over the last year with your uh, Baptist without an adjective. Um, what, what motivates that for you? Where is that coming from, from, from a personal level? Yeah, that's a good question. The, you know, I, in many ways, my involvement that began a few years ago with the Baptist for Alliance kind of reinvigorated my passion here. Mm. Uh, of, I was probably close to walking away completely from Baptist life, wow. uh, in all honesty. Yeah. And then, Seeing Baptists from around the world coming together, worshiping together, fellowshipping together, despite differences. You know, uh, one of the things that's, that's particularly moving is when there are international conflicts, to see the Baptists from the two sides still coming together at these meetings. You know, right now with Ukraine and, and Russia and, and having those Baptist leaders uh, together at these meetings, that this allegiance to Christ's kingdom uh, is superior, it trumps any other, you know, allegiance that we may have. And I, I think that that is exciting to see. Uh, it's inspiring to see. It's exactly the prophetic witness that we need in our society today. And so I think that's a big part of it. And so that has kind of brought me back into uh, being excited about Baptist voices and the conversations that we have and, and what we can do uh, in society. Yeah. No, that's really, really helpful. Um. So tell me a little bit. So, so we've talked a little bit about Word and Way and its its broader reaches and how you're you're uh, expanding kind of your scope of the journalism to include American Baptists, Cooperative Baptists, Missouri Baptists, Southern Baptists, and the like. Um, you're also doing the podcast. Uh, tell us a little bit about ChurchNet. Then, w what is that, and how are you involved there? Yeah, so church. Yeah, so I currently serve as associate director of Church, and I've been on staff for I guess a little over 15 years in in various roles and very part time roles. Uh, and and that's actually all of our staff is part time. And one of the things I think is interesting about ChurchNet is that we are trying to think of a new way of being a denominational body. The the 1950s model doesn't work today, and I'm not sure it actually really worked that great. Uh, but yeah. uh, it, all of our staff are bivocational. All of the staff are involved in a local ministry, uh, on staff of a church, or pastoring a church, or involved in some other type of ministry. Okay, uh, and, and so it's a, it makes for a lean operation. It's much more of an attempt to be focused on the needs of the churches, uh, recognizing that historically the Baptists have said that the our hierarchy works in kind of the opposite direction, mm -hmm. that the denomination is there to serve the churches, not the, way, the other way around. Right. Uh, in many ways, uh, in you and I have been working our way down the hierarchy. Right, <laughs> absolutely. From local church ministry to uh, regional or, or you know, state denominational ministry. Mm -hmm. and so we, we claimed that, but like you were saying on the priesthood of the believer, we don't necessarily always act like we believe that. Uh, and so we've tried to model that with a, a lean operation, with a focus on what are the churches actually needing. Uh, we focus on a few key initiative areas that are 
derived from what we've learned from churches by having listening sessions and surveys. Uh, so we have a mission, missional collaboration, which is our missions partnerships, which have been focused in Guatemala and Cuba and Ukraine. Uh, we do uh, focus on generational engagement, uh, which is a team that I led until recently. I was able to pass that one on to someone even younger than I and uh, more qualified <laughs> okay. uh, to lead that. And I think that's a really significant area a lot of churches are struggling with right now mm-hmm. is, is how do we reach those younger and new generations Yeah, in, in our congregations. Uh, we focus on community involvement, uh, engaging in local communities, getting outside the walls of the church, uh, the needs of the community, the people in the community. Sometimes it involves advocacy as well. Uh, and then also strategy development. And that is this idea of doing some planning, of thinking about uh, the way we do church the way we should do church uh, and, and not just kind of going forward with doing things the way we've always done it. Right. Not really sure why. Mm-hmm. And so with those four key areas, we, we, we pretty much are, you know, we tell churches, let us know what you need and we'll come serve you. Right. Uh, we, 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 we've been focused on churches in Missouri. That's historically our background. Uh, but we, we've told churches and, and we, we, we practice this and do this. We will serve any, any church. Uh, and so any church in Missouri that has contacted us, whether they've ever given us a penny, uh, if they have a need that we can help them with, we help them with. Uh, and sometimes we don't hear from them again. And sometimes they start engaging uh, a bit more. Uh, but that's a, you know, it's, it's, it's an attempt to try to find a new way of thinking about uh, denominational life. Uh, and I think that it's, it's something that we've got to do across Baptist yeah. life and, and other denominations as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, American Baptist, um, kind of hung on to the societal model when as we grew and so our our mission societies and our home mission societies and foreign mission societies and men's groups and women's groups are all kind of independent separate societies um and so the idea of creating another network as as a resource pool would make a lot of sense to the mind of an american baptist um i think it's it's a big uh shift for maybe um, a Southern Baptist mind where everything's just a cooperative program and everything goes up and then comes back down in an umbrella type fashion. So, right, right. Um, yeah, no, good on you for, for doing that. And it's, it's mostly bound to Missouri. You said it doesn't really expand into like the areas where word and way goes yet. It's, it's not quite Kansas uh, yeah, exactly. and Nebraska. Yeah, not as broad as word and way is yet uh, a little bit outside the borders, but again, part of that is that the history, the, the organization started in 2002. Okay. Uh, I started on staff later. Uh, and again, it, it was birthed out of some of that Southern Baptist conflict in Missouri, and mm. we moved. You know, uh, I think that that's a seems like a long time ago now. We, we've we've kind of moved away from a yeah. lot of that in, in ways, but uh, but yeah, we we have these conversations always like, well, it'd be great to do more, and you know, uh, but right now it's been it's been still very focused on the, the churches that helped bring it to birth. We're all in Missouri, and that geographically has been been where we've been focused. Yeah. Well, I think the ministry model is, is repeatable and, and, and certainly something that we can learn from here is uh, American Baptist in Nebraska for sure. So, um, so, so you've got a lot of stuff going on, but um, do you know what's next? I mean, do you got anything coming down the line, okay. a, another book, m- more publications, um, expansion of any of these ministries, yeah. or just a vacation well, maybe? Know, away, there's always something coming <laughs> next. I got a weekly podcast and a monthly magazine. So next is the January issue. Oh, I mean, my goodness. The December issue to press, so... Uh, you know, that, that deadline, you know, seems to always roll right around the table. Uh, yeah. and so, but yeah, uh, I would love to know what's next. If, if God tells you, please, please let me know. <laughs> uh, got- I always have a couple of books that I'm working on, uh, but you know, they've, it's been a little bit slow, it's been a little bit uh, crazy the last couple of years with sure. some of the other roles. I mentioned, I, I stepped uh, aside from the generational engagement team of ChurchNet. Uh, I still do some communication administrative work, yeah. Uh, but I'm looking forward to doing a little bit more of my own personal writing by uh, moving away from that position and perhaps take a couple of book projects that I've been working on, uh, particularly focused, again, on the intersection of religion and politics, uh, w- which is where you know, a lot of my writing and, and academic passion has been mm. uh, in those areas. And, uh, so hopefully uh, we'll see some new books coming out in the near future right. from me. Very good. Appreciate it. 
Well, it's been really, really good to talk to you today, Brian, and uh, I appreciate you taking the the time out this afternoon to share with us your heart for for Baptists, for unity, um, your your passion for bringing many voices to the table so that we can all hear one another and uh, l- learn to be in each other's presence as we all seek to be the hands and feet of Christ in our various contexts. So. Um, my guest today has been Brian Kaler of Word and Way and uh, Baptist Without an Adjective podcast. Um, I encourage you to go check out that podcast. It's really good. I've listened to nearly all of them and have been encouraged by them, and so they're very good. So check them out on iTunes and wherever else you get your um, podcasts. And uh, if our listeners had questions for you about your ministry, ChurchNet, Word and Way, podcasting, any of that kind of stuff, uh, how would they get a, get a hold of you? Yeah, sure. So you can you can find us at wordandway.org mm-hmm. uh, is a good way. My contact is there. It's My email is bkaler at wordandway.org. You can also find me personally and find my email at briankaler.com. Uh, uh, Brian has an I, and Kaler is like a, a tailor who doesn't know how to spell. So uh, <laughs> briankaler.com, uh, you can find, find yeah. all the links to the various ministries there. Very good. And we'll throw up all those links in the show notes of the podcast as well, so you'll be able to see them right there um, underneath the play button. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Well, thank you for listening to Mission in 5, the podcast. Keep tuning in as we introduce you to the many church leaders, pastors, and missionaries impacting the churches of Nebraska and the larger American Baptist community. Check out the show notes for links and contact information to our guest today, Brian Kaler. There you will also find links to his website, the Word and Way magazine website, his Baptist Without an Adjective podcast, and ChurchNet. Subscribe to this podcast at Podbean, iTunes, and Google Play. While there, be sure to rate and review us so we know how you are enjoying the podcast and making it easier for others to find in the future. Send us ideas on who you would like us to interview for future episodes. And as always, feel free to support us by giving through PayPal on our abcnebraska.com website. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.